Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Mass Sergeant Kevin Osbin. I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Kiana Holloman and Emily Zarsk. How y'all doing, ladies? Good. Good. Yeah. How's it going? So check out where I'm at today. So I'm, I'm currently on the road. Uh, I'm visiting the Tinker Exchange. And they come in and they put me in this cool conference room and they got this awesome backdrop of Chief Chat. Check, check me out back here. I know it's amazing. They did an awesome job. Looks Listen, they got some they got some creative <laughs> folks, and man, they always treat me so well when I come out on these visits. So um, but we got a super uh huge guest today. I'm super excited about it. And uh without further ado, Kiana, please introduce today's guest. Today's guest is one of Hollywood's most successful screenwriters. He is best known for writing the screenplays for hit films Jurassic Park, Mission Impossible, and Spider-Man. Today, he joins us to discuss his new book, Aurora, available tax-free at shopmyexchange.com. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to David Kapp. Hey. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> I got to get that extra applause to follow me wherever I go. It's very <laughs> <laughs> that, that that's our five five dollar production budget that we have uh for the for the show so you know we, we put it to good use thank you but thank you so much for for being with us today and uh can you let our viewers know where you're coming to us from yeah sure uh nice to be here first of all thanks for having me chief i'm in uh amagansett new york which is uh out on the eastern tip of long island um it's a place my family and i have been coming for in the summers for about 20 years and um it's you know it's august yes but there's still a few weeks left to squeeze out of summer before school and work and everything starts up again so that's where we are you know what this this is the first time on this show and in, in, in my life personally that i've ever heard the word ambiganza and that's a lot of vowels for me <laughs> but uh <laughs> so so thank it's you for a being the cool first place yeah, thank you. It's a very cool place. It's an old fishing village. It's actually started in like 1680. Um, so it's it's been around for a long time. Wow. So we're excited to dive into discussion on your latest thriller, Aurora. You're a celebrated screenwriter who has written more than two dozen featured films. So what inspired you to turn toward novel writing? Um, I, it sort of just happened. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd been writing screenplays for 30 years. I think it started in the in the late 80s um, after film school. And my ideas just always came to me as movie ideas. So it was sort of natural. I just never assumed they would be anything else. And in the back of my mind, I always thought, oh, I should write a book because it seems like that's what real writers do. And screenwriters have this massive inferiority complex we carry around. Um, <laughs> so I, I always kind of wanted to write a book, but you know, I had these ideas that I thought were movies. So maybe four or five years ago, I, I had an idea and said, I'm just going to start writing about these characters. I wanted to get to know the characters a little before starting the script. So I said, well, I'll just write in prose a little bit. There was this guy, this guy in his mid twenties who has a job he hates. And I wanted to see him arriving at work, see what that was like and how he felt. And I wrote like a page of it and thought, boy, this is fun. Um, you know, screenplays, writing screenplays is a very particular craft. You're limited in terms of what you can do. You can only write down what an audience might see or hear. Um, anything else, there's no way to convey it in a movie. But in a book, you can write about how they're feeling, what they're thinking, you know, what it was like for them when they worked at McDonald's when they were 17. You can digress. And, and I just started having a lot of fun uh, writing it in prose. And by about page 10, I said, well, maybe this should be a short story. And then on page 50, I thought, oh, maybe it's a novella. And then I think on page 75, I admitted, I guess I have to write this as a book. So um, I did, and I loved it. So I wrote another one. And 
David, since screenwriting is mostly collaborative and novel writing is more independent, how did you begin writing the book and what are some of your favorite things about writing solo? Oh my God, did you get that right? Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> screenwriting, screenwriting is relentlessly collaborative. You are, uh, and sometimes that's great. And many times it's a drag, you know, you are, you're not so much collaborated with as collaborated upon. Um, and, you know, it's why I occasionally direct a movie, because even though that that's not work that I'm naturally suited to, I don't think, but you kind of just want to see what it's like every once in a while, the way you see it in your head. Um, so, but you got, you know, you get used to that. And sometimes like any group endeavor, it can be great, you know, like if you like your collaborators and you have this sense that you're working toward a purpose that matters, you know, they're your teammates and they become really important to you and your successes you have together and your failures you have together. Um, but writing a book, I was just, I was just stunned by how quiet it is. It really is you and your thoughts and typing. And that goes on, it takes longer, you know, cause books are long. And, um, that goes on for quite a while. And I like that. I mean, I'm, I'm a guy who does okay in a room solo. I, I, I enjoy that. My favorite part of the process is sitting around often in this room, making up stories. And I, um, so, so I really like that aspect of it. And then when it came to, um, get, you know, selling the book and having an editor, I was like, okay, well, here come the notes. Now's when it's going to be, you know, pretty awful. And they were so gentle. It was, I couldn't believe it. Everything they, they phrased was like, you know, one thing, maybe if you want to, it occurred to us, don't do this if you don't want to. Um, you know, like it was also, and I was like, you guys have no idea what I've been hearing for 30 years. This, this, is, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is gentle. So um, it was just a very different experience. And I love the solitude and I love that when the book is done, I can say every decision in that I made. Uh, but I miss a team there. You know, I wasn't part of a team. I was me and, uh, you know, teammates are great to have. So I like them both. Yeah. I say the same thing about Emily and Kiana. Yeah. I, yeah, I like my team, <laughs> but I, <laughs> they're awesome. I like being by myself as well. So <laughs> Yeah. And you also, but, it's input, you know, you say, I like, I want your input. I like your input. I, I, I love, I love hearing what you have to think, uh, to a point. <laughs> awesome. But it seems like everything you do, everything you touch turns to gold or platinum or whatever the, 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 the standard is for uh, the high standard it is, whether, whether it's films or movie, I mean, well, whether it's movies or, or a book and Aurora is no different. So, um, for those that haven't got a chance to check it out, uh, can you kind of give us a, a kind of Cliff Notes version of what Aurora is about? Yeah, sure. Um, first, about about the first thing you said, I I wish everything I I, I touched turned to gold. Although that might get boring. <laughs> um, I've had my share <laughs> failures, you know, and some of them big uh, failures. So it's not, um, and also with any screenwriter, there's the movies you see, but those are the ones that got made every screenwriter has a stack of things that just didn't get made. And, you know, so there's a lot, there's a lot in the garage that you don't see. And the, thankfully the ones that people seem to remember are the movies that work, that are, you know, that are good and they tend to forget about the bad ones. So, um, anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> hopefully you don't have to wear those around <laughs> your neck. Um, so the book. Okay. So I, I, I was very interested in the idea for Aurora in the idea of powerlessness, you know, both literal and metaphorical. I wanted to see a while ago, back in the mid nineties, I made a movie about a blackout and it was a three day blackout and it followed these three characters. But since then I was thinking, boy, I wonder, I wonder what that would be like if it lasted a long time, like a year. What if we had no power for a year? So I started looking into how, how could that occur? And it doesn't, take long in that kind of research to discover that a, a coronal mass ejection from the sun is something that happens quite regularly and really screws with the earth's magnetosphere. S 
so I'll explain a little more what that is, that um, the sun sort of belches out electromagnetic energy all the time. Um, during periods of high activity, there's three or four a day. And there are these massive clouds of plasma, you know, drenched in electromagnetism. And mostly they just shoot off into space and are never heard from again. Uh, in some cases, they hit the Earth. Uh, almost always, it's a sort of a glancing blow. Uh, the last one was in, uh, the last sort of notable one was 1989. And that led to the Quebec blackout, which was a major blackout that spread into the northern part of the United States. And that was from a tiny, tiny impact on the edge uh, of the Earth's magnetosphere. Um, but what happened in the last major direct hit was 1859, and it was known as the Carrington event. So I started reading about it, aside from the fact that it has a cool name. And what happened is these these Plasma bursts are so densely, um, there's so much power in them that they will blow any, any electrical system that's plugged into a grid. Now, in 1859, that syst the only system that, did, that used electrical energy was the telegraph system. So telegraph operators reported, you know, lines melting, their signal boards, the relays bursting into flame. And the telegraph systems worldwide were down for a few days. Most people thought it was just kind of a fun, quirky space event because the Aurora Borealis, you know, those beautiful green swirls in the sky was, was um, visible all over the earth, except for a tiny band around the equator um, for days and days and days, you know, lighting it up like daytime. And so most people thought this is really spectacular and then it faded and they went back to their lives if and when because it happens every couple hundred years it hits the earth in present day as you know our entire lives are hooked up to the grid um everything the lights in your house banking national defense everything is relies on electricity computers the grid and that interconnectedness and it would all blow and it would blow so badly that it that repairs would take 12 to 18 months so i started researching um i just pulled a few government reports because there are you know they have conferences and meetings and talk about what to do and the we're so unprepared it's it's you know scary um as you saw in the texas blackout you know in the winter of 2021 um our grids are kind of rickety and there's not a lot of political uh, appetite for spending money to, to strengthen them. Um, so I, I thought, okay, well, there's a, there's a great disaster scenario, but I don't want to just do some global disaster. Everybody dies story. Um, I wanted to follow two people. They're a brother and a sister, one of whom is quite wealthy. And he's one of these guys who's completely prepared for any disaster that comes. He's a prepper as a hobby and as a personality. Um, and she is completely unprepared. Her life's a mess in many ways. And certainly, you know, she's not ready for something like this. And then I wanted to intercut their stories and see how can it kind of fall apart for the guy who thinks he's so prepared and how can the person who isn't discover some inner strength and get through this? So uh, that was the story I told. Uh, well, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned. Oh. Now, I was Go gonna ahead. say it's funny you mentioned uh, Snowmageddon here in Texas because uh, you know we're, we're all living. We live in Dallas, Texas, and and that was a huge mess. And I think we were like a couple of minutes away from not having power for like the rest of our lives or something weird like that that they were saying. But it, it it's it's crazy that uh, you, you kind of you wrote a story, kind of. I guess I won't say predicting it or just knowing that's a possibility. Yeah, it's sort of raising a, a, a warning flag and saying this is this is something to think about. I know we've been through a lot, but there are a few and we can't get ready for another mysterious pandemic. We can, you know, know a little better how to react. But but this is something we can prepare for and it, it doesn't take that much. Um, so it, it, it seemed like something that was worth, worth pointing out. 
Awesome. And I was going to just say that I felt like I really related to Aubrey as far as like just not being prepared uh, because that's kind of my life is I'm not prepared for anything. (laughs) I'm the girl that is running late and then gets in her car and realizes she's on empty. (laughs) So that's kind of my life. But um, so the book's epic is a quote from Mark uh, Vonnegut to his father, Kurt, in which he says, we are here to help each other get through this thing whatever it is. Over the course of the thriller, we see the character of Aubrey taking care of everybody, so to speak, and her brother Tom refusing to let anyone into his bunker. What was your thinking behind this contrast and how does it add to the story? Um, Good question. At at first, I want to say about being unprepared. Uh, Me too. Um, (laughs) And you'd think... (laughs) You, but you'd think, well, I don't know what my excuse is, because we've all gone through COVID, so we know, you know, unexpected things happen and disrupt our lives and might be nice to be prepared. And then I researched this book extensively. So you'd think my basement would be filled with batteries and drinking water and, you know, <laughs> I have none of that. I may, none. I have maybe some extra refried beans. That's just because I like them. <laughs> you too? So it's yeah so it's human nature there are two i feel there are many kinds of people but in this regard two types one actually kind of likes thinking ahead and finds it soothing even if what you're thinking about is scary and the other type likes to pretend it's not going to happen and i am i am a let's pretend it's not going to happen type um i don't know i should work on that (laughs) um but the, the, the other thing you were asking is why, what did I want to bring out in focusing on those two character types? Yes. And what was your thinking behind the contrast to add to the story? Mm. Well, I wanted to tell a story of a brother and a sister. And, um, you know, all of us who have siblings know that some of them we resemble and some of them were like, I can't believe we have the same parents. This is very, very <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I um, I wanted that was important to me um, two people who are related but don't try and try to get along but don't really understand each other and don't see the world the same way and in one of the one of the themes that I wanted to explore was how sometimes in trying to control everything we break it and make it fall apart um, whereas when I know when I'm faced with a situation I didn't expect, if I, the quicker I accept the situation and try to adapt, the better, you know, the better, um, the better I do in it. And I think there's an old expression, um, a military expression that, you know, we're, we're always fighting the last war instead of the next one. Um, so that we're, we're, we're not ready for this. We got ready for that but this isn't that, this is this. And I think that applies to our lives. The, we're, we're, we, we go on experience and we react to experience, but it's very hard for us to react to what's happening right now. We try to equate it with something we've seen before and it may be things come along that we haven't seen before. So I felt like telling the story of a crisis and two people who come at it from completely different points of view and have unexpected things happen to both of them that was just kind of juicy and I could really get my head into it. And I also, you mentioned the quote at the front of the book from Mark Vonnegut. Um, co- that, that comes from my experience of COVID. And it was, you know, I had the idea for the book before COVID and then COVID happened and I wrote it during lockdown. And I, I said, well, I can't, I can't let these characters be unaffected by COVID. You know, you, when you read a book or see a movie these days, there tend to be two choices. The, the, the creator either says, hey, I'm going to pretend this is a world where COVID never happened and you have that story and that's fine. Or it is a world where it happened and the characters have to have been changed by that because we were all changed by that. So my experience, I was lucky. I didn't lose anyone. Um, my family and I were together a lot, a lot. Um, and I got, I got to the end. That was great at times, magical at times, maddening at others. 
but I got to know my neighbors in a way I never did before. And I realized how important they were to me. And so I wanted, I wanted that sense of community to become important and how one community might thrive and another community might fall apart. So. Awesome. And so we also have had the, you know, the, the, the distinct op, uh, opportunity to uh, interview other authors. And we always talk about the kind of balance between like having a, a vivid imagination and, and, and accuracy uh, when, when writing. Um, I, I think I was talking to one about writing a military story, but uh, you know, as a military member, you want to critique and make sure that it's, it's authentic and it's got the right rank structure and all kind of other things that you look for as a military movie. So uh, how much did you, you and, and for this movie, you know, I don't know if you got a lot of scientist friends or, or, or folks that in that world that, that are like, man, that could never actually happen on blah, 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 this, that, and the third. But uh, how, how did you think about the scientific accuracy when writing the book and uh, kind of what was your research process to help bring the story to life? I went through, it did need a lot of science. It needed a lot of understanding of science because I, I do believe that reality really helps a story. Um, unless it's a full on fantasy, like, you know, Game of Thrones or something like where it's just a whole other world we don't recognize. But if you're setting your story in a world that we, that we all feel we know, you better get it right and you better, better make it feel believable. So um, what I, my approach to the science in both this and my previous book, um, Cold Storage, my approach to the science was the same. I, I do as much research as I can on my own. Um, you know, the internet makes pretty much everything available. Um, because I want to get it right, and you're also inspired by the things you find out. You get ideas from reality. Um, but then I want to tell my story. I, I feel like my first responsibility to the reader is that it be fun, interesting, and move quickly. So, and have, you know, great characters. So those are, those have to be right. If those aren't right, all the research in the world won't save you. <laughs> it's, you know, you're lost. So I want to get that right. So I write the first draft just based on my research and I don't want anybody to tell me that's not real, that won't happen, that's dumb. Because then I'll lose, you know, confidence and not do it. Um, but then when I'm done with a draft that I like, um, now it's time to find some advisors. So uh, in, you know, in the case of the first book, I needed to find a microbiologist. And in this book, I needed to find a solar researcher and a preparedness specialist. So um, then I send it to them. And I remember in the case of the microbiologist on cold storage, I sent it to him and said, okay, doctor, have a look at this, um, read it please have a good laugh, you know, at how, at how terrible it all is. And, uh, and then if you're, if you want it, let's talk and, you know, we can, uh, I'll, I'll listen and try to make it better. So he read it and he said, um, he called me and this was, I remember the conversation started this way. He said, well, I read it. It's a lot of fun. The science isn't awful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can build on not awful. That's, you know, that's cool. And then we started talking about this, no, that, no, this maybe, what if you change that to this? And then I, and I did it that way. And so you're, you're constantly balancing between what do I think is important in terms of reality? And what do I think I just can't change because this has to be a good story, first of all. So that's the balance I'm, I'm trying to hit. Man. I got I got to upgrade my my friend list because I don't I don't have a microbiologist or a, a disaster preparedness <laughs> friend in my Rolodex at all. I I would have to go to LinkedIn or something and just just Google some people and see if they could be willing to read something. You know, you got to ask around. I don't know those people either. So you know, you ask people you know who might know, or I'll send a blind email. Um, and most people, what I've found actually through all my writing experiences, most people want to talk about what they do for a living. I mean, they do it for a reason. They think it's interesting. And if you go in and you're respectful and you say, I want to get it right. I, still, I want to tell a good story, but I want to get it right. Um, and you're open. They're great. You know, I bet 
when I call you in six months because I'm working on a military thing, I bet you'll give me some good advice. You know, um, if if you Absolutely. sense the person has, if you sense the person's not trying to, you know, lie or tell something stupid. <laughs> Absolutely. No, Kiana's got Kiana's got those friends in her Rolodex, though. She's she's connected. <laughs> right, we got you. So, David, <laughs> you're getting a great reception on our live feed. Um, for the sake of time, I'll just share a couple of questions. Um, but Chris wants to know, you've been successful in so many different movie genres. What's your favorite to write for? Um, let's see. You know, they're they're I, I try a bunch of different things because I love all sorts of different kinds of movies. So um, so I wanna try my hand at them. And I try my hand at them to the point where I fail at something because I say, oh, okay, well, maybe I love that kind of movie, but I, that, I'm not great at writing it. Um, I'd say my favorite, you know, if I was just gonna sit down and write something for myself and then, you know, go out and try to sell it, get it put together as a movie. I have to say, I really love a tight little thriller um you know i i had a movie i did that came out earlier this year called kimmy on hbo max that zoe kravitz is in i really recommend it highly i think it turned out great but um that was a i just love a, a i love a suspense movie um did a movie called panic room a while ago that um david fincher directed i, I love a confined space and you know just tense visual suspenseful situations. That's probably my favorite thing to write. Okay. And then also Robert says he's curious about the turntable set up behind you, including what the record is. Well, Robert, um, this is very cool. It's, it's a, it's, it's actually my daughter's, but I put it out here. Um, I gave her my old one. It's a fuse, uh, which is, uh Oh, Thanks, Robert. Now my copy Thanks, of the cars. <laughs> the cars' first album is scratched. Uh, it's a fused turntable. It's really cool. It's upright. It's balanced. Uh, it's not a fortune either. It's like one hundred eighty dollars, uh, and the sound is pretty good. And it has a radio and a USB. I was I didn't come here to sell fused turntables, but <laughs> and the record I just I just dropped was uh, the cars debut album uh which was great you know with let's go this was 1979 yep uh possibly before your time but i was 16 <laughs> years old and that album was it 79 was definitely a good year that's the year i was born so <laughs> <laughs> there was a pause i'm well, just saying i'm just saying <laughs> funny no robert probably would know he used to be um a music writer a music journalist so yeah and he says he loved the cars so he's glad that he asked about the app so, ah, for yeah. the record <laughs> there's a few there's a few of them in there and we also have a special viewer with a few questions as well for you david riley glenn is a college senior film student at the University of North Texas. So let's welcome Riley to the chat. Hey. Hello, Riley. <laughs> hey, Riley, what's going on? How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Oh, I, I can't complain. I can't complain. And glad to have you on the show. Um, for Thank you for that, having no, me. Riley is the son of a member of the Chief Chat team, so we're we're excited to have him on here. We're and and hopefully you know this 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 chat will inspire him to do some great things in the future. But uh, the floor is yours, Riley. Yeah, I just had a couple of questions. Um, my first is when you are um, working on like a, a screenplay project, do you have a, like a schedule or a routine that kind of keeps you kind of keeps you on track? Yeah, I. Um... I used to be a nighttime writer when I was younger um, because it was quiet and, you know, you stay up late, you're, you're oriented a little later when you're young. And um, then I had kids and that all changed. So now I love, I love mornings. Um, I tend to work in bursts. You know, there's, there's a period of thinking that goes on that takes a while. 
and you're taking notes and you're thinking and trying to figure out what's this and maybe you talk to people a little about it but don't talk to, about it too much a because you'll bore them nobody really wants to hear your half-formed ideas and <laughs> b because i found that the more i talk about an idea the less i feel the need to write it um and then uh once i start then i then i i start jotting down notes you know like about who this character might be or or um just any idea really send myself a lot of emails which i park in a file um and then when i then i need to outline so i um outline on you know the three by five cards i lay them out on a coffee table and stare at them and think oh that goes near the end that goes near the beginning this is sort of taking shape and when i feel like i have an outline that's okay um i you know not finished but maybe not you know not sketchy but not finished then i start writing and once i start writing i don't take days off i try to write straight through because it's really as you know it's really hard to get the the creative wheel rolling and once it is don't stop and a weekend will kill you doesn't you don't have to work like a 10 hour day you can write pretty intensely and get a lot done in four or five hours um so yeah, I'd say that's that's it. And then I'll try to keep going and not stop until I reach the end of the draft. Okay, so you you kind of just power through that kind of helps you. Um, is there any other like tools that you have in your toolbox to to combat writer's block? I don't think writer's block exists. I think I think we all live in a permanent condition of writer's block, which is I don't feel like doing this. I don't have any you know, I don't feel great about it. Um, I don't want to. And I think it's that way with a lot of work um, and physical exercise. You know, I think it's very similar to exercise. <laughs> I start a jog and I say, no, this is, it's too hot. This is ridiculous. I'm not doing this. I'm not. I'm, I can't believe this run starts with a hill. What am I doing? You know, it's it, <laughs> there's just all the complaining. And then I noted, you know, five, 10 minutes into the run, I'm like, oh, this is actually nice. Uh, it's a nice day. And, you know, um, and I think it's the same with writing. At first, I sit down sometimes and I feel very blocked. I feel like I don't know what I want to do. And so I'll jump into the middle of a scene. I'll say, well, I do know that at some point I want her to tell her father, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I'll just write that and have her talk for a little bit and say what she has to say to her father. And, and then as I'm writing, I will start to have other ideas. Um, Einstein said, inspiration occurs during composition. The, the act of sitting down and starting and beginning to concentrate it itself will generate ideas. But if you walk around and wait for a bolt of brilliant inspiration to strike, you'll be walking around forever. It, it, it doesn't really work that way for me. Okay. So oh, yeah, my short, last short answer is... to your question, short answer to your question would be, butt plus chair equals script. You know, sit down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, my last question is, um, do you have any advice that you could give to young screenwriters such as myself that are just starting out? Yeah, I got, I had two chunks of advice that I think are useful. One is, um, one is for how to live your life. <laughs> so you're ready for that. Um, <laughs> try, you gotta, you, you gotta put stuff in your head. So watching movies is super important and I'm sure everybody does. You wouldn't be writing movies if you didn't like them. Right. Um, but you also gotta, uh, go, look at photography and go to museums and go to hear music. And I can see from the wall behind you, you do all those things, you know, um, you gotta, yeah. you gotta put stuff in your head. And so you're soaking up music and you're soaking up art and photography. And, and this is the most important thing. Meet people who aren't like you. Um, try to have a couple friends where, who nobody can figure out why you're friends with them. You know, and and just in the reason is because there's something about them that you find interesting. You don't have to like it, but you may find it interesting. I have a friend who's so rude 
I I can't you know he's he alienates a lot of people and sometimes when I'm with him <laughs> I have to say um, that was too far and you gotta you gotta pull it back and he'll go oh was it oh I'm sorry and I think he genuinely doesn't know you know and so I, I love him and and you gotta you gotta fill your head up with a whole bunch of different experiences and things and then you shake it up and what comes out is you that's your point of view on life you know it's not just like where you grew up it's what it's what you're what input you're getting on a daily basis um so there's that advice then the other one is try to similar to my mathematical equation for producing a script if you someone told me early on and i wrote it down and put it over my desk try to fall in love with the daily process of putting words on paper uh, or a screen um and if you can actually enjoy that doesn't mean you have to love it every second you're doing it but if you like sitting down and those are some of the more peaceful hours of your day then you will win everything else will sort itself out because if you like what you're doing you will probably start to do it well okay. well thank you and, i appreciate yeah. you answering those questions for me yeah sure and yeah, and Riley, once you start making it big, and and you need a a retired, overweight, uh, military former military member, like I'm your guy. Just just don't don't forget about me. It started. Awesome. I'll put that on my Rolodex. <laughs> awesome. So, so the, David, I'm glad you mentioned uh, you know all those key points because you can probably apply that to so many different things in life. You know about who you hang around with. Uh, I think that's why Kiana and Emily hang around me because I think people are still trying to figure out how we got to be a team. But but uh, it's <laughs> those were some words that kind of transcend transcends just uh, film writing or, or screenplay or whatever the case may be. So thank you for those uh, awesome words. And also, uh, we heard that you were kind of working on an adapt adaptation of Aurora into a feature film. And so how's that going? And, um, how does it feel to collaborate with other minds to transition your book into film world? Um, it's going well. I'm working with um, the director, Catherine Bigelow, who uh, you, you probably know. She's br the brilliant director. She did um, Hurt Locker and Zero Dark Thirty and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and uh, so I'm working, on, I'm working on the screenplay now um, uh, as we speak um, for that. And it's fascinating because... I wrote so I wrote the book and it has a particular point of view um, uh, on life and it's my point of view because it's my book. Uh, Catherine's a different human being, so she's got a different point of view. And you know, as you know from her movies, she's not afraid of some of the darker sides of the human nature. So the movie script, and the movie script is changing from the book, and she was a little worried about that at first. Like, are you? mad that I'm messing with your story and I said oh god no not unless uh not unless you buy, you know burn all the copies of the book uh, but the book exists and it's one thing um and the movie is a whole other thing and a movie has to reflect the point of view of the director because they're the one who has to go out there and get up at 5 a.m and you know endure the hardships of making a movie because it really is difficult God, especially some of the stuff she's chosen to do is physically arduous, emotionally difficult. And um, so you, I think your job as a screenwriter is to try to get inside the director's head and reflect what they see. So it's been fascinating for me. And I, I like it very much in part because it's a somewhat different story than the book was. And that's, I think, important. Um, because I worked on the book for two years and, you know, by the time we shoot, I'll work on the script for a year and a half and, you know, you don't want to just type up the same thing over and over again. You gotta, you gotta change it. Yeah. So we are going to mark our calendars whenever we can to make sure that we check out the film when it's ready. Um, before we say goodbye, can you remind our viewers where they can go to follow you and keep up with all things David Kett? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm on Instagram uh, at DG Kep. Um, if you search me, I'm the one with the blue check mark, not the one <laughs> who's asking you for money. 
Um, <laughs> important to know. And uh, um, I have a, if you're interested in uh, screenplays, um, I have a website, davidkep.com, um, which I think they just put up there. And there it is again. And um, I, I, what I did is over the years, people have asked me, do you have a copy of this movie draft or this script that you wrote? And I, you know, back in the day, Xerox it and send it to them. And then I found, oh, my goodness, I could save a lot of time. So I put them all up in a section of my website called Script Archive. So I got a whole bunch of stuff in there. If you're curious about screenplays, what I think is interesting is, you know, like a movie like Spider-Man, I think I have half a dozen different versions of the script up there. And you can see how things evolve over time if you're interested in screenplays. If you're not, you're going to find it very dull. Um, but um, check those out. And as a reminder, authorized shoppers can purchase Aurora tax-free, shopmyexchange.com, or in select exchange stores. I obviously already have my copy, um, so make sure to grab yours today. It's a good read, and um, Aubrey is just my favorite character. I don't feel alone anymore <laughs> with the way I live my no, life. Oh, I'm so glad. Aubrey. Hey, let me ask you a question. <laughs> who, would, who would you cast for her? Just like a name or two that pops immediately to mind. You know, you're not going to be held to it. I'm just curious. Okay. All right. Well, the person that pops in my head, but I think I'm a little biased because she's one of my favorite people, um, is Emma Watson. I don't know. I just think she's great in everything she does. But I don't know if, that, but I'm not good if that's a fit. I just look at like, oh, I like everything you do and who you are. <laughs> so. Right. So I'd want to go to her movie. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Right, but I All don't right. know. I don't know. Who would you cast? I don't know. I try really <laughs> hard to keep the actors out of my head while I'm working. Because later you find out who they are and you rewrite to suit the actor. And, you know, so right. I try to keep them a character just for as long as I can. That's pretty I'm so smart. Glad you I'm very her. biased. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so for our Chief Chat viewers, uh, this episode will be available on YouTube and Spotify. You can rewatch with your friends or catch up with past episodes. Also, be sure to join us back at 11 a.m. Central on August the 9th as we welcome Drew Anthony and Justin Graber to the show. Uh, set your calendars for 11 a.m. on August 16th when Major Tom Schumann joins the chat. And we also have a super talented Jamie Foxx that will be on the show on 23 August at uh. 2 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. That's cool. I'm sorry I wasn't Jamie Foxx. No, you, listen, you're you're <laughs> just as cool. big as as anybody that we've yeah. had on the show. You've 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 inspired us in, in so many different ways. You gave us uh, this escape uh, of re kind of reality and and fantasy all at the same time, so we can you know sometimes take ourselves away from the madness that we call this world and 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 focus on something else. So we appreciate you for your time here on the show. Uh, you know, all that you're doing for the military community is appreciated. Uh, we also, uh, you know, like I said, whatever, all you do means so much to our nation's heroes and we wish you all the best. We would like for you to stay on, on the chat, um, just, uh, after we go live to kind of say our formal goodbyes. But again, you know, you spending the last 45 minutes with us has done so much for a lot of people. And, and I'm sure Riley, oh, you. uh, you know, He'll, he'll be the talk of his class right now because he got a chance to actually have a conversation with with a a, a prominent prominent uh, everything author screenwriter filmmaker it's it just it's awesome so thank you for this thank you thank for you. having me it was a pleasure absolutely so with that being said thank you again and chief chat out